Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ron Shamir. I am professor of computer science at Tel Aviv University, doing work in algorithms, genomics, and more recently, uh, EMRs. Uh, Several years ago, together with Elazar and uh, Iran, we initiated a partnership with the Center of Bioinformatics at uh, Tel Aviv University, which I headed. And there have been many Tel Aviv students who participated in these uh, uh, CGSIs over the years, and I'm happy to be here uh, this time. So this is the plan. I wouldn't tell you our basic biology after uh, hearing the talks this morning. I'll talk about uh, three projects uh, involving multi-omic uh, uh, data. And uh, I'll leave time for just to mention a few projects involving EMRs that we've been doing recently, just by highlighting the titles. OK, so the general problem that we are talking about is uh, the, the vision of uh, precision medicine, that rather than treating every patient with the same drug, as, as a result, some are helped, some are unaffected, and some are hurt by the drug, uh, we will use the EMRs and the omic data available in order to tailor a different treatment to each subgroup. And therefore, ideally, everybody will be uh, positively affected. And the first project of this type, this is, was work of uh, Nimrod Rappaport, uh, who recently completed his PhD in the group, uh, dealt with uh, uh, the TCGA data. So TCGA is a wonderful resource enabling uh, data of uh, some 30,000 a cancer patient over uh, dozens of cancer types. And for each individual, we have multiple modalities of data, uh, genomic data, uh, copy number variation, gene expression, methylation, and more. Uh, one of the problem is if we want to analyze these together is that each of them has different quantities, different statistical properties, and uh, the problem that we asked, can we use in an integrated fashion, fashion uh, multiple omics data to analyze cancer subtypes? So this means clustering. So the problem that we have at hand is multi-omic clustering. And we reviewed the literature, and there, were, there are quite a few methods for uh, doing clustering of multiple, if you wish, matrices, where each matrix is a set of features of a different kind for a particular uh, individual. And uh, without going into a description of the, of the different methods, some of them are uh, statistical, some of them are more uh, straightforward combination, we chose representatives of each method, uh, of each approach. And we also uh, noted that some of these methods actually originate in the machine learning uh, uh, community, where this problem is called uh, multi-view clustering. And actually, may, most of these were not tested on omics data. So we created a benchmark where we looked at 10 TCGA cancer types. Each one uh, had a few hundred uh, patients. And we focused on three omics, gene expression, DNA methylation, and microRNA expression. And uh, we set aside the clinical information available at the uh, TCGA for each uh, individual uh, for the evaluation. So, uh, what is, how do we measure quality? We end up getting uh, clusters, and we look at the uh, survival uh, curve of each cluster, because we have the information for each uh, individual how long until, uh, until the individual uh, died or until the disease uh, returned. And we use the log rank test of separating uh, survival curves 
for this, uh, uh, for this assessment. In addition, we looked at six specific uh, clinical labels that were common in most cancer types, and there we used uh, either the chi-square or cross calwalic uh, for uh, evaluation. Uh, I'll show you the results soon, but on the way we decided that we, it's time to develop our one, own method. And uh, we used a network similarity approach. So we build a network where the nodes are the individuals, and the, the edges between the nodes reflect the uh, similarity of each pair. So uh, mathematically, we have a profile uh, for a particular omic L. We have a pro profile of patient I, for example, the expression of all the 20,000 genes in, in if the omic is expression. And we look at the uh, neighborhood of each uh, node, the neighborhood of each individual in uh, that omic. Namely, we look at the uh, K closest uh, individuals in terms of their uh, uh, distance in that omic from our individual. And uh, we define a similarity matrix uh, for that omic, where uh, it is similar to a radial basis. Uh, we look at the exponent of the minus the, uh, the difference in the Euclidean distance. And the key here is the normalization factor, this sigma uh, in the denominator, which is the average of the similarity of, if we are looking at the uh, uh, sigma of i, j, and l, and remember the l is the omic, so i and j are the two uh, nodes, the two uh, individuals. So we look at the average distance of i to its neighbors. This is the first term, the average distance of j to its neighbors. And the average and the, the regular uh, total distance between i and j, and uh, the relative similarity is defined for a pair of uh, nodes, just as the uh, similarity as defined above, divided by the total similarity of the neighborhoods, averaged between the two, or summarized between the two nodes. Okay, so as I say, it's a, it's a variant of the radial basis, and this is all for a single omic. And to summarize across omics, we do the most simple thing possible, namely average. Okay, we get this relative similarity for each omic, and then uh, we average. But maybe we'll postpone questions to the end. Uh, so here is the overall algorithm. We compute the similarities as we just uh, uh, showed it. Uh, and then we perform a spectral clustering using the, uh, the spectral math clustering method, which is a well-known re relaxation of a normalized cut. And to determine the number of clusters, uh, we use a slight variation of the eigengap method. So the eigengap method looks at the eigenvalues of the matrix and order them and look at the largest gap. And this point is the number of clusters. And we multiply this difference by uh, the index i to nudge the number of uh, clusters slightly higher. Now, there is only a single parameter here. It is uh, uh, it's k that we need to dis, uh, determine. And, and uh, note that this method uh, does not require uh, imputation. We can uh, directly address missing data. But by summarizing over only the, uh, the present uh, uh, values that we have. So here is a summary of all the the results of all the methods that I've shown you before, together with Nemo in the last column. Uh, so in the first row, we look at the number uh, of cancer subtypes after, out of the 10 attempted, for which we obtained uh, different survival according to the log rank p-value. And we see that Nemo does best. It is 
tied as best in terms of the number of significant clinical parameters in eight out of the 10 uh, cancer types. Uh, in terms of the number of clusters, it is sort of midway. You see that we are at uh, 4.5, while there are other methods that range between 2 and 10. And in terms of run times, it is the second fastest, only uh, faster is spectral, which we use as a subroutine. Here is another uh, uh, summary of the results. So here we look at the average uh, uh, log rank p-value on the x-axis and the average number of significant clinical parameters on the y-axis. And uh, NEMO, uh, you see, is not uh, uniformly best, but it's on the Pareto optimal contour together with two other uh, uh, methods, MCCA and uh, RMKL. Here is one specific example, a type of leukemia, AML, and here we had nearly 200 patients and 170 with full data. And you see here on the right the uh, five clusters that were obtained, and you see the survival curve of each of the clusters. And uh, Nemo's results were better than all other algorithms. It was better than using just the 170 uh, samples with full data. And it was better than any single omic. And moreover, when we compared it to what is known about AML, uh, French-American broad classification, we, uh, there was a good match to some of the clusters. So to summarize this part, we did a broad the benchmark of multi-omics methods and developed also our own network-based method, which was overall but not always uh, best, uh, both on full and, and on partial uh, TCGA data. Uh, since we published it, there were two benchmarks that uh, uh, studied this problem, and they both uh, mentioned that uh, NEMO performed best, in one case tied with uh, SNF. On the, along the project, we, uh, uh, we had some insights. For example, we realized that not all omics always contribute positively to the clustering result, and sometimes for particular clusters, it is beneficial to look only at the, as a subset of the omics. So we came up uh, with a generalization of clustering that enables defining cluster with a different set of omics for each cluster. Uh, and we also noticed that the uh, p-value approximation used for, uh, for the long rank method that everybody uses, hundreds of, uh, tens of thousands of papers, when you apply it to the kind of sizes of data that we have is too optimistic, and instead we implemented the permutation-best exact method uh, uh, that is slower but much more accurate. And uh, the benchmark and the tools are uh, available uh, on uh, GitHub. Moving on, this is a project by uh, Jonathan, um, master student in the group, who, who, which was since uh, published in uh, uh, NAR with Nimod. And looking generally at the integration challenges, we, uh, we have three types of challenges. Uh, one is like the, the red bottom row is where we have a single omic and multiple data set, and this is well studied as the batch correction problem very well understood. Uh, the green uh, column uh, is the situation where we have multiple omics on a single data set. This is what we just discussed. Uh, algorithms like, like, uh, like uh, MCCA, NEMO, and our other algorithm, Monet. And then the most general problem is where you have multiple, this is the blue set, this is multiple omics and multiple data sets. Uh, and the different data, set, data sets may not share neither the uh, omics nor the samples. 
So specifically, and, and there are a variety of methods like this, a small number actually, most developed in the context of single cell uh, uh, genomic data. And here we focus, uh, focus specifically on this problem where uh, the, uh, the omics are gene expression and DNA methylation. So we have two data sets. One is only gene expression and the other is methylation. And the samples, the individuals behind the, uh, the groups are disjoint and we still want to analyze them together. So here is the method in a nutshell. Uh, in the training phase, we need a data set that, is, uh, uh, that has uh, both omics for the same set of individuals. And there we built a, a lasso regression model per gene uh, to predict the gene expression based on the DNA methylation. And we look at the methylation sites, which are within a range of plus minus 10 kb from the gene, the number is typically a few hundreds up to a couple of thousands. And the output is the 2000 model uh, with the best uh, R square. And now for the real data, again, we have now a two data set, one only the methylation and other only expression, non-overlapping samples. And then we use the models that we uh, train to predict the gene expression on the first data set from its methylation. And then we uh, clean the data because there could be a situation where either the uh, methylation uh, signal or the gene expression uh, had the low variance. So we keep only a subset of the 2,000 genes uh, that uh, are, uh, have sufficient variance in our data set. And now we have, on, for data set one, we have the predicted gene expression on this set of genes. For data set two, we have the uh, original uh, gene expression, and we apply canonical correlation analysis uh, reducing the data sets to uh, common dimension D which is a parameter of the method. We call this method the uh, intent. So the result is a joint embedding of the two data sets into a single uh, low dimensional space. In practice, we use something like uh, D equal 40. So let me show you some results. Here we looked at 11 cancer uh, uh, types from TCGA, a few hundred uh, samples in each. And in each case, we trained the model on 10 cancer types, built the regression, lasso regression model uh, for, uh, for a gene, for each gene, and then used the 11th data set to predict the uh, type and do the embedding. And since we know what is the correct embedding, uh, the, the correct matching in this case, we measure by the results by what fraction of the embedded points of the same, uh, of the same individual were closest to each other. Okay, so this term is uh, used in the literature. It's called the FOSC TTM, fraction of samples closer than the true match. So the slower it is, the better. So here are the results for the 11 uh, data sets uh, of uh, intent and uh, several other algorithms. So again, as, as the lower it is, the better. And you see in green, the, this is the uh, leftmost column that uh, uh, intent indeed does much better than the other methods, typically one or two order of magnitudes better. Another attempt, this is a harder challenge where we, so maybe I'll skip this, uh, I'll show you the second challenge. And here we are looking at uh, uh, four uh, uh, cancer types, and we want to do the integration together for the samples from the four cancer types. So on, the, on one hand, we want the samples are coming from the same individual to be closest. On the other hand, we want the different cancer type to be separate. 
So, uh, and, and the training is done on the seven other castle types that were not included in the test. So here are the results. So let's look at uh, the picture. What you see here is that uh, uh, this is a UMAP embedding of the methylation and the expression data separately. Uh, and here you see the, uh, and here you see on the same embedding the, uh, the four different uh, cancer types. Here you see the uh, uh, result of each of the four algorithms colored according to the, uh, the omics. And you see indeed that Intend is doing a very good job in terms of mixing the two uh, cancer types, unlike the other methods. Uh, if uh, on the row below you see the uh, coloring according to the cancer types, and indeed the coloring of intent is uh, quite uh, separate among the four cancer types. Uh, MMDMA also does a pretty good job, and so does uh, Sera with uh, one one type of mistakes, and Liger here does a poor case. So again, the, in terms of uh, FOSC-TTM, uh, uh, intent is two orders of magnitude uh, better, but uh, it also separates the different cancer types. Well, uh, maybe I'll skip this example and summarize this part. So we developed a method to integrate uh, the methylation and expression profiles from different data sets using a combination of uh, uh, regression and uh, uh, embedding using a canonical correlation analysis. Uh, here, it was critical to have the information that the biological knowledge that the methylation site around the in the neighborhood of the gene are relevant. If we, we try to do this genome-wide, then it didn't work, but may, there could be perhaps a way to do it in a way that will be more general. So we could think of generalizing this to other omic pairs, and also uh, the embedding phase could be replaced by other methods uh, that uh, are tailored to single omic multiple uh, uh, data. Uh, the third project is of a different kind. This is a, Ga, a work of Gal, again, a master student from the group. Uh, and here we are dealing with driver genes. So, as we know, in many uh, cancer types, there are uh, dozens and sometimes hundreds of mutated uh, genes, somatic uh, mutations, but only a small number of them are the drivers who. Uh, infer, uh, confer growth advantage uh, and transform the, uh, the cancer from one stage to the other. So this is a small number, but the rest of the genes are mutated genes are uh, passengers. And there is a lot of literature of, about fun, finding driver genes in cohorts. Uh, and there's uh, uh, even a database of uh, validated uh, driver genes. But we wanted to ask, can we do this on the level of an individual sample? Not on the level of a cohort, but on the level of uh, an in individual uh, sick patient. So why do we want uh, to do this uh, ranking or pri prioritization? Uh, first of all, of course, the treatment m depends on the driver mutations. And if you see here the distribution of the number of known drivers in lung cancer, you see that sometimes there is zero number of known mutations, and sometimes there is more than 10. And of course, if we want to do combination uh, treatment, we cannot use 10, we can use two or perhaps three. So uh, ranking uh, of the candidate uh, drivers is important. So there were a couple of papers uh, that preceded us that did uh, at, uh, address this problem. Uh, Don rank and SES are two algorithms and they use the expression data uh, 
the mutations and the, uh, as a, an additional omic, they use the protein protein, the global protein protein interaction uh, network of the genes. And uh, PPI networks are very useful, but they are noisy and biased, and therefore results were so so. And we developed our own algorithm that again uses mutations, expression, and PPI. But we also use a, 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 set, a, a set of known pathways that are known from the literature in order to drive the algorithm. So here is the, the idea in a nutshell. So suppose, this, uh, suppose what we are looking at is a particular pathway. And the, uh, the gray gene is the mutated gene. And the uh, pink genes are th those that are uh, differentially expressed. So if this gray gene is a driver, the signal should propagate from it to the pink genes or to some of the pink genes across the uh, network of this pathway. So we formulate this using the uh, uh, formulated using the prize collecting Steiner tree problem, and we compute this uh, PCST score for hundreds of pathways, and the summary of this score is our uh, uh, will determine our ranking from the JIT. So how does it work? So here is, a, for example, in this example, you see that the. The, P, the optimal PCST does not cover uh, all the pink genes, but it uh, somehow has a positive node for the pink genes and negative uh, cost for, for the edges, and this would be the result. And we evaluated the two other algorithms, and we also looked at some uh, graph centrality measures that are known from the literature. And our gold standard was a set of uh, around 250 uh, CGC genes that are known experimentally verified drivers, uh, uh, SNVs. And we used the uh, precision recall and F1 to measure the results. So here is the result first on the network that was used in the first two papers. And you see here the ranking of the genes according to each two method and the average F1 score. Uh, and in this case, we use the pathways from the Reactome database. And you see that uh, Prodigy, that's the name of our algorithm, is uh, consistently better than the two other methods. Uh, we also looked at uh, uh, two other uh, databases of uh, uh, pathways, NCI and KEG. And here uh, we used uh, Prodigy used the string network, and uh, Donrank uh, and SCS used uh, their network. And again, we, you see the advantage of uh, Prodigy. What is interesting here is uh, to look at the centrality measures, like, uh, for example, uh, the betweenness or the closeness. So the, the green and the blue lines you see here are doing a better job than the previous methods. So this is a method that is completely oblivious to the data that uh, is available on the expression. All it uses is uh, it ranks the genes according to their centrality measure. So centrality could be the the degree or the closeness or the betweenness. And you see that consistently the method, the methods that are based on the network only are doing better than the previous method. So the famous problem, the, the, the main uh, problem or feature of, of uh, PPI networks where there are hubs, nodes of very high degree, is dominating the additional signal. While on the other hand, if you look at the prodigy results, they are not dominated by this effect. So to summarize uh, this part, uh, prodigy is a new algorithm for personalized prioritization of uh, driver genes. It does better than extant method. And unlike the extant method, it is not controlled by the network topology. So this is a problem 
everyone should be aware of when using a global PPI network. And the key idea here was to use signals across separate but multiple uh, uh, pathways. Uh, and again, the, uh, the algorithm uh, is available uh, on our uh, GitHubs. Okay, so I left a few minutes at the end to talk uh, very, very briefly about uh, some work that we've been uh, doing in the last few years in my group on uh, EMR and uh, ML uh, studies. So uh, one uh, uh, work that we did was to look at uh, data from routine checkups. So this is not regular EMRs, but uh, about annual uh, visits of individuals typically sent by their uh, company or employer to do a thorough checkup on one day about uh, 600 different parameters are measured and the question and we could in this was Israeli data so we could uh, match the IDs of the individuals with the cancer registry in Israel and look at those that developed cancer within a couple of years after the last uh, checkup. And the question is, can we predict cancer risk in healthy individuals based on this data? And we did it uh, both for uh, breast cancer and for uh, uh, prostate. And the answer is that we can do better than previous methods. And we are now extending this to a larger cohort, and hopefully we'll be able to catch additional, uh, to cover additional cancer types. Uh, technically, what we are using here is a random forest uh, where uh, we apply the uh, survival analysis uh, at each node in order to split the, uh, the samples according to to have the most distinct uh, survival uh, subgroups. We also, uh, during the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, we did uh, a study in two hospitals in Israel predicting uh, deterioration of uh, COVID-19 in patient. Here we used a variety of uh, standard machine learning uh, methods. Uh, and we obtained quite a good prediction, better than was a published before for uh, predicting deterioration within the next uh, 24 to 36 hours. And the, 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 the method that worked best in that case was cut boost. Uh, another study uh, that we did with uh, uh, internal medicine in Israel's uh, largest hospital was uh, looking at uh, uh, data available upon admission and slightly after that for individuals with uh, uh, infection in order to, to be able to distinguish between bacterial and viral infection. And here, uh, following a clue of our uh, partner physician, we focused on the kin kinetic of uh, CRP. CRP is a protein measured uh, uh, as a standard uh, in uh, uh, ER and in, in uh, uh, internal medicine in Israel. I know in the US it is less common, but it turns out that the dy dynamics of CRP is highly uh, valuable for distinguishing bacterial from viral infection. Uh, another work that we did with COVID had a particular uh, very unique uh, data set. So this was a, a set of 500 patients where in addition to the EMR data, we had also uh, echocardiography measurements. So uh, for each of those 500 con consecutive individuals, uh, the uh, clinicians came to the patient's uh, uh, bed and uh, performed the echo measurement and the question was whether uh, having this additional uh, echocardiography information helps. Uh, the answer is that uh, it does help but not uh, sufficiently, uh, the difference is not sufficient to justify the extreme uh, uh, extra 
effort required. And again, we used pretty standard uh, machine learning. Uh, we also have a uh, work uh, uh, on bioarchive where uh, uh, we tr developed our own imputation method. And here uh, uh, we are using a combination of forward filling and uh, iterative imputer. So it's the the iteration behind the mice algorithm in order to, uh, to do uh, imputation. And we, all, we show that we are doing better than previous imputation methods. And also that having this, uh, our method impute the data, the prediction of a future uh, uh, adverse event is better than in previous uh, uh, imputation methods. Uh, perhaps our first study of this kind was looking at the uh, uh, New England Journal of Medicine competition on the sprint and the uh, accord data, where uh, uh, we looked at uh, uh, patients that were treated, with, uh, there were two arms, and patients were treated more aggressively if their uh, blood pressure level uh, past uh, a particular threshold. And uh, unlike the other methods in the, in the competition, we looked not only at the baseline measurements before the randomization, but also of the, the longitudinal data because the patients were called every three months to get a new medication label based on their performance. And, not surprisingly, but very decisively, the longitudinal data improves the results uh, substantially after, over what was done. Uh, the last study that was just published is not really EMR, but it is related. Uh, we looked at the polygenic uh, risk score that was developed on the European uh, population for breast cancer. And we applied it, uh, adapted it to Ashkenazi women in Israel. And the bottom line is that uh, unlike previous report that looked at uh, populations that are more remote from the, uh, the GWAS that was used to create the PRS for the Ashkenazi women, uh, the PRS uh, quality is still very good, and actually the biggest HMO in Israel is now considering using it uh, to determine uh, uh, the age of mammo mammography on this subgroup of the population, and we are now in the process of extending it to other uh, uh, populations in Israel. Okay. So I want to thank, thank my group and my funders for all the work, and thank you for your listening. Thank you very much.